by building the product first, never talking to clients. That's actually rule number one clause when you build a startup. Like, don't, don't, don't build a product and spend six, seven months in a cave building it without talking to no one. Welcome to the e-commerce coffee break podcast. In today's episode, we discuss why AI is the key for brands to survive in the future of e-commerce. Joining me on the show is Valong Safa. He is the founder of Behemix.com. And then launching it and hoping it's going to work and then try to change the market. So let's dive right into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to find out why AI, artificial intelligence, is the key for brands to survive in the future of e-commerce and also what this has to do with behavioral science. Joining me on the show today is Valon Xafa. He is the founder of Behemix, an AI platform for the entire e-commerce ecosystem. Valon has years of experience with AI, machine, machine learning software, and previously worked for Google building data-driven applications. So he's definitely the expert to talk to today. So let's welcome him to the show. Hi, Valon. How are you today? Hi, Klaus. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Obviously, the future of e-commerce is AI-driven. We see that everywhere. There's more apps popping up every day. Can you unpack for our listeners and explain why artificial intelligence is such a critical factor for brands moving forward? Yes, for sure. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons why is that the case. Um, but the primary reason is that um, a lot of processes uh, are being done manually. And a lot of decision makings are being done everyone's best guess. And um, in an e-commerce, which has become very competitive, um, in an e-commerce where things have changed a lot since pandemic. So when pandemic uh, when pandemic hit, a lot of things have changed. Before pandemic, um, money used to be cheap, low interest rates, low inflation, and um, also low ad costs. So mm -hmm. for brands to grow. Um, there was a straightforward process, just throw more money into ads and marketing, bring more traffic, simple strategy, right? That's not the case anymore. Right now, ads are very expensive because of all the updates, privacy updates, data protections and all stuff. Ads are very expensive. Uh, first, money is not as cheap as it used to be. It's actually more expensive compared to uh, pre-pandemic. And for this reason, the simple strategy they used to work before pandemic, pre-pandemic, it's not really working that much, right? And because of that, you can already see this on, on, on metrics and revenue across different brands, across different platforms that e-com has slowed down since pandemic. Mm -hmm. So now we're in, we are back to the drawing board. We're back to the drawing board, trying to identify uh, what strategy should work, uh, what's the future of e-com, um, and how can we build long, uh, sustainable, long-term strategies to grow and survive? Why I'm saying survive? Because pandemic has changed the rules of the game. And we already see some potential contenders worldwide. We see some brands out there that um, they didn't start as brands but they start as tech companies. They build the whole tech were advanced. And then these brands use that tech to identify what products to build, what products to manufacture, what products to sell, on which channels to which target users. A completely different holistic approach to what we see already in e-com. So in e-com, you already have like uh, very traditional brands that have been around for a long time who potentially start as retail brands back in the 50s, 60s. And then they moved to uh, moved online in the 90s and early uh, 2000, right? But they didn't start as tech companies. But the new brands that are coming in that are actually um, rolling over the market. I can definitely say that because for a brand with that approach to go from zero to like multi-billion dollar company within like two, three, four years, this is something that we don't see in, 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 in brand growths out there, right? This really tells you that um, gives you a bit of a glimpse into the future and how the future is going to look like in e-commerce, right? And the future of e-commerce is going to start with, with tech, is going to start with AI, is going to start with information, is going to start with insights. Every decision that you're going to make, it doesn't really matter if it's like what products to sell. Uh, it's going to start with uh, knowing the user base, knowing the demand 
of your consumers, understanding the behavior of your consumers, right? You cannot get a product market fit by building the product first, never talking to clients. That's actually rule number one clause when you build a startup. Like don't, don't, don't build a product uh, and spend six, seven months in a cave building it without talking to no one and then launching it and hoping it's going to work and then trying to change the market so that it fits your product and not the product fits the market, right? For that reason, what we usually do in startups is that we start talking to potential um, potential users. We start asking them questions. Uh, what do you like? What are your issues, your challenges, needs? And then based on this feedback, we iterate on the product. So it is a um, customer, client, user-driven process. And we see the same process in, in, in e-com right now where specific brands tech-driven, AI-driven, uh, one of them also Amazon. It's like the, the, the largest one in the world, but there are some also some new ones coming from, uh, from the Far East. And um, these brands have built this tech because you cannot go and ask. When you build a, a product as a startup, you, you go and ask a few people and then you get a, enough subsample of, of what the users need. Uh, when it comes to e com these companies have built the tech to ask uh, to 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 identify the user behavior, the user demand, the user trends, and then build products fitting the needs of these segments of these user behaviors. Yeah, I want to dive a little bit more in this behavioral science part of it yes. because I think a lot of people understand AI, what they see with Chat GPT, large language models, and they're quite different from what you do. And with Behemix, you're you're doing AI for a long time. Since 2019, yes. you started much earlier than anyone else out there. So talk me into what behavioral science basically means in the context of what e-commerce sellers can do with it. Yes. Uh, so understanding the user behavior and the user behavior is multi-flavored uh, in a way that um, we're talking about demands, we're talking about behavior, we're talking about like the click-through rate, we're talking about future interests, we're talking about demographics, we're talking about uh, a lot of different factors, right? Understanding how these preferences, how these demands change over time and what impacts these demands to change, these interests to change, right? So this is the behavioral science into it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand, let's say if a specific segment likes some pairs of shoes or jeans, for example, this demand is not going to stay for long. There is no right now in e -com, there is it's very hard to see trends that last for years like it used to be. You have trends that last for weeks and that's it. You have new trends. Right. So the question is, what factors out there, what factors in the world? Even outside e-com, I'm talking about inflation. I'm talking about weather. I'm talking about temperature. I'm talking about a lot of a lot of different factors that are not directly related to e-com impact the user behavior on e-com. Because this is the most important fundamental thing that a lot of brands out there, a lot of people who work in e-com, um, uh, see e-com as an isolated system. They see the brands. They try to bring users. It's a bit more complicated than that. Because, for example, weather impacts the user's behavior and then the user's behavior impacts the sales on site, right? So you need to understand how is weather impacting the user's behavior. And then you have inflation, for example. Inflation, uh, the cost of living in, in different countries, different areas, even within a country, have a huge impact on the user behavior and the preferences. There are a lot of studies, for example, that that were done even in the 80s and 90s, which show, for example, uh, an interesting fact, which show how inflation or the cost of livings impact the preference for a specific color on shoes or jeans or shorts. You see, Klaus, it's, it, it has to do a lot with psychology. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, economy, the world economy, it's all about driven from user behavior, right? We buy stuff, the economy keeps going. We don't buy stuff, we get stagnation. 
and we get a lot of other issues, right? So that's why for uh, for the economy to grow, the consumers have to spend. And then you have this, this sustainable cycle out there, right? And that's why understanding how users are feeling, how users are behaving, and the factors, external factors, inflation, weather, cost of living, competitor uh, data, for example, prices, is very important to understand the user behavior because this is where the user journey starts in e-com. It doesn't start when the user lands on your store. And we have seen that. And we have measured it mathematically and statistically and also with AI that if you want to, if you, let's say, try to predict the user behavior, what the user is going to do on site just based on the, the click stream data, it's not going to be as accurate as, for example, incorporating external, all of these different factors that are externally. Let, let me jump in there. Um, maybe you can give our listeners a, a real life examples how your system with causal AI is helping e-commerce brands to identify and to overcome sort of where they get stuck with the user behavior. Yes. So um, within e-com, because traffic is driven from different channels and there are like different times of the day and that then you have also um, the, that performance of the site on its own. You have the products and let's say the sizes that are available. So there are a lot of factors. So the user behavior is not only, uh, let's say a function, a factor of a list of variables outside the store, but also inside, right? So if if a product is, is a top selling product, but the main size is unavailable, you know, like it's not gonna sell because the demand is for a specific size. And this is usually the case all, all the time. So the power of law, this this kind of like curve or the long tail, as you also call it, is all over the place. It's with the sizes that are being sold, with the revenue, few products account for a huge portion of the revenue, for example. It's the same sort for the user behavior. Few users spend uh, the most of the time, if you account the whole time that users spend on your store, right? It's very common there. So, um, because of this, there are different friction points. First of all, it's the behavioral part where users have so many options clause to choose from. Let's say you go and buy, you want to buy t-shirts. You have 20 different t-shirts on the first page. And then you click to the second page, you have another 20 different t-shirts. And they kind of like look similar. They look the same. Maybe sometimes price change and this and that. So what happens is that you have this, this paradox of choice, which is called in behavioral science, where you have so many options to choose from uh, and you get just stuck. It's very hard. We as users, uh, we as humans in this case, are not that good at making decisions when we have a lot of options to choose from. It's better, it's better to have this or that instead of like, here you go, 10 different options. And let alone what happens in e-com. So this uh, this paradox of choice, but there are so many other cases that happen when it comes to users interacting with all of these different options. And then you have prices, for example, users ask themselves, okay, why do these products look the same, but this product is a bit more expensive than this one, but the expensive product has less reviews than the one that has a lower price. You know, so a lot of questions that, uh, arise from you clicking around. Some of them you have consciously, some of them you have subconsciously. And this creates friction from the behavioral perspective, from the psychological perspective. The other friction is, for example, clause um, is a, the VAP experience. VAP experience is huge in terms of impacting the user behavior, impacting your ad costs, impacting a lot of different factors that relate to revenue. And it's not just loading time, but there are adders. For example, there are a lot of adders, images they don't load. Um, there are some products that have missing pictures because there were placeholders for three pictures and the brand uploaded only two pictures and then it doesn't look good. So there are a lot of, friction points when it comes to the VAP. And the interesting part is that when we browse online, Klaus, I can imagine also for you, what you usually do is like you go on Google, for example, you write shoes, shorts, and then you click the first one 
uh, online store. The second one, you open multiple tabs and then you compare products, you compare prices. Subconsciously, you compare experience too. Mm -hmm. You compare, you see, okay, this store looks legit. This, I like this experience. You know, it's all about the experience and the experience comes from the web performance. If a page or if an online store takes longer to load, it's going to give a, a bad experience. So th there are cases and it's very common that you buy maybe a bit more expensive product on a site that looks a bit more legit or you have this, this experience, this good experience, smooth experience, then actually going with a product that has lower price and maybe even it's the same product at the end of the day. Because you also think, for example, you have a lot of questions that we ask as humans um, subconsciously, for example, are they going to return my money if I, for example, return it back? Uh, how weird, how difficult is going to be the returning process? You know, like, and all a lot of other questions, the customer support. It's all about like feeling legit and the web performance gives us legit feeling. Then we're talking about the frictions in terms of products. Let's say your top selling product um, has its size, its top selling size, it's unavailable. So when you account and combine all these different friction points we're talking about 15 20 25 up to 30 percent in revenue being lost being left on the table because this is a lot of money if you want to bring this traffic this revenue by throwing money into ads it's going to be millions of dollars and so what a platform does is that it applies ai with high accuracy because we can achieve that to understand user behavior, to simulate user behavioral in real time and understand and measure these different friction points and perform automations so that the users, they don't have to go through these um, paradox of choices, through this um, unpleasant web experiences, for example. And at the end, we also measure the uplift clause of, of, of all of these different automations to prove, to provide to, to or customers or partners or clients or brands that we are actually delivering and these automations actually increase in revenue. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, let, we're let not going to charge. So <laughs> that's the important part. Let me ask you about the automations. Now, a lot of our listeners, most of our listeners have a, have a system or a store on Shopify or on WooCommerce, any of the other platforms. And they're probably not very technical they're merchants they want to sell they want to be don't want to become a data scientist or a web developer from a day-to-day -day basis how does the implementation of behemix look like and what kind of maintenance or homework does a, a merchant need to do to get it up and running yeah so we're, we're a good question so behemix integration is is platform agnostic so we're not dependent on the platform right uh, the installation process is a single line of code and maybe the users are going to say, yeah, we heard that before, uh, you know, and it took like three, four months. Um, well, give me some time to show it to you. If it's, for example, on Shopify, we can literally install Behemix in, in two minutes. You know, it's just a line of code. You copy, paste it. It's the same story for all the custom built online stores. It's a single line of code because we already have a lot of information and we already know a lot about your store even before integrating with you guys so that's the important part what we do is that when we integrate we um, collect the user data in real time and then we combine it with our causal models to identify and measure these revenue bottlenecks right so that's kind of like the process so it's it's few hours to maximum few days depending on 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 the, the the process and depending on the process from the client side uh, regarding the effort we're not an analytics tool where we just say you like hey your conversion rate is one percent you know we explain this part why is your conversion rate one percent we identify these revenue losses and then you have a list of automations where you can run to tackle all of these different revenue losses and then being able to measure the uplift generated from all of these different automations. If that, if that makes sense. Makes, makes totally sense. One question comes to mind is 
while the AI automates processes and optimizes the process, is there still a, a, a human element in there? So where the merchant can go in and do some things that they don't want to do so that they're not have the feeling they're completely based on AI. Yes. Yes. So, so the way it works is we provide a dashboard um, where they can see all the results. Um, so because there are like different angles, there are different angles, verticals within the online store where the revenue can be lost, where automation can take place. I'm talking about, for example, web performance, I'm talking about product related, merchandise related. I'm talking about psychology related. So it's not just one angle. If there is a, a, a single feature tool that um, promise you 20, 30%, that's probably too good to be true, right? Because these revenue leakages, they are small and localized and it's hard to identify. But there are so many of these clause. Mm -hmm. So when you combine 2% improvement here, 3% there, 5 here, 6 there, you combine all together, you tackle automatically all of these together, you're going to go to that 20-25% improvement. And that's the important part. So our users, the clients, they can go to the dashboard, they can see all the results, they can see... Uh, because these automations are measured with A-B testing. We have a control that measures the impact, right? We don't want to say, oh, the automations are running. So that's pretty much it, right? We want to actually prove to our, our partners and clients and brands that these automations actually are driving revenue. And at that level, 15 to 20%, they will also be able to see it on their Google Analytics dashboard or Shopify dashboard, right? Because it's a very noticeable difference. Mm -hmm. I'd like that you mentioned that this kind of optimization process is coming from various parts of your business. So it's not the one big thing that you change and then one of a sudden your conversion rate goes up. And I think there is no, out. there is no clause. There is no, like in the world, in the world, there is no magic stick. Okay. If, if one believes that with just a single change, you're going to increase revenue for 20, 30, 40%, right? I don't think that's plausible, not from, and this is coming from, and this is coming from, uh, from an AI person who measures and analyzes the user behavior on daily basis or around the clock, right? If you see something that promises you that this goes in the direction of like rich, get rich, fast schemes. So this is something that's it's, it's very important, right? And uh, but what is really important is that this also in terms of the future of AI, not only in ecom but in in worldwide, right? Um, AI is going to change so many and automate and improve so many different parts of the industries of our lives that when this is accumulated and combined together, it's going to have a huge impact. Right, so that's that's important part. For example, uh, for example, when smartphones were invented, you know, like the big deal was not because you could talk to somebody and take pictures because we already had cameras before. The big deal is that you had so many different apps, so many different options, so many different things that you could do with this that would improve your life in different angles. That this whole process combined had a huge impact on, on changing our lives. And that's the same story with, with e-com, for example. Um, there are a lot of revenue leakages. We call revenue leakages, right? Uh, there are a lot of issues, for example. So let's let's take, let's take another uh, interesting example because we do measurements all the time of different platforms and site speeds of performance and all stuff. It's very important for us to understand. Uh, for example, let's say Shopify, for all the Shopify users out there, um, Shopify has is probably one of the slowest loading platform out there. And um, this uh, is so obvious. It's not like one, two, three percent different. It's like 30, 40, 50 percent difference. And because of this loading time clause, loading time is, is probably one of the most important factors out there that impacts literally everything. It not only impacts your revenue on site, it impacts your ad spending, ad costs, because Google measures loading time. It impacts organic traffic because it's one of the most important factors for SEO. 
So the impact is multidimensional. Having a um, a well-performing online store, website in this case, is the starting point. And then you have different angles when I talk about the psychology, the paradox of choices. So you have uh, revenue leakages in terms of um, product, merchandising, all what's come with it. But when you combine all these things, different different things together, then you're going to get the, the good number that you're hoping for. Yeah, absolutely. I think you gave a masterclass on the overview of what behavioral science, actually the huge impact that it has on e-commerce. So tell me, Behemix, what, who is your perfect customer? We primarily work uh, with starting from the low end of uh of mid size, so it's mid enterprise. Uh, but we do uh, we do also want to help brands that are close to the mid size to get on the on the mid market. At this stage, we we, we don't work with um, you know like small moms and pop shops uh, on on Shopify. Uh, primarily, that's that's kind of like the focus. Um, so yeah. Okay. How does your pricing structure work? It's uh it's performance based. It's performance based. Um, so we're not gonna charge. We're not gonna charge unless we prove that we're generating revenue for you. That's that's important part, right? As I said, there are a lot of automations, which combined are gonna recover this money that is being left on the table, and we're gonna measure that, and then we're gonna charge based on the performance okay well, that's legitimate i think that's that's a good plan uh, because yeah. the more you grow then obviously you, you take yes. your cut but it's really the performance makes sense yes. there before our coffee break comes to an end today is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet there is a story that i i usually always bring with um when i talk to brands and and people in, in e-commerce and um there is a story that already happened in other industries and this only shows you the future, a glimpse of the future of AI and e-com or the future of e-com. So back in the 70s, uh, Klaus, um, stock trading was done completely manual on phone calls. There were a lot of stock traders and all stuff, right? And um, there were some pioneers who saw the future of stock trading, that it's going to be algorithm driven. It's going to be with computers. The first computers, they just came out. And they start building the first algorithms for stock trading. The issue was that they had a hard time getting access to data because there was no internet back then. There was no database. So they had to go and look for books and get these numbers manually and write down and create CSV files to train these algorithms. <laughs> and we see the same story right now in Ecom. We had in the beginning, such a hard time finding quality data, which is the basis, quality data. Even from different data providers, the data was not that high in quality. So we had to get from different sources and process and analyze and clean and all the stuff because it was very hard. But what happened in the stock trading is that these people who started the algorithm tradings, now these firms are the largest firms in, in hedge fund management and high frequency trading and all stuff. And there are almost no stock traders who do that manually. There are stock traders who manage computers, but there are very, very few, 0.1% of what they used to be. And right now, if you want to build an algorithm trading firm for stocks, it's going to cost probably half a billion to a billion. And it's not guaranteed you're going to make money off of it because the industry has developed so much that it's very hard to get in this game. It's already consolidated. Mm -hmm. And based on the data that we see, based on the trends, based on some of these insights and the, the power of AI, we do see that it's going to be that the future of e-com is going to go in this direction. So if you really want to be there in the future and then and, and survive and grow, this is the right time to, to, to jump in. Because if you're not going to do that, someone else will. And we already see who are literally doing this. We have Amazon, we have Walmart, we have the big guys who 
are, for example, hiring machine learning engineers for SEO. So this is also, for example, a trend, uh, an interesting trend. You can just go to uh, job postings. You will see machine learning engineer for SEO, right? So think about it. Think about where SEO is going to be in the future. It's going to be fully automated. It's going to be on a level like the algorithm tradings. You won't be able to do anything manual. You'll just lose money. It's not going to work. It's not going to be efficient because all the firms have have advanced this field so much with hiring machine learning engineers and AI people to work on SEO. So think about it. No, I totally agree. I think you, you just um, proved a couple of opinions that I have on SEO, on apps, on the future of e-commerce. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that what you just said is going to happen very, very quickly. And we will see a huge shift in the market, in the user behavior, and how you interact when you're shopping online. As we come to the end, where can people find out more about you guys? Um, on our landing page, behemoths.com, or they can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Um, and then I'd love to I'd love to share uh, with them a glimpse of the future of e-commerce. And especially you mentioned the SEO part. Um, we have uh, we have a product that we are launching soon that goes in the direction of optimizing organic traffic with AI. And based on the initial results that we actually see right now, uh, SEO is going to be SEO is going to be one of the first industries to be fully automated on the same levels as high frequency trading because the, the level of automation that we're able to achieve with this new product that we're launching soon is something that is not seen in the market. So we see that coming and it's going to come from different direction, which is good because for the efficiencies of the market, but it's very important to, you know, like jump in when it's not late. Absolutely. I will put the links in the show notes that our listeners can reach out to you. I think that was a very deep and interesting um, dive into the future of AI and what AI can do already today. So Balon, thanks so much for your time. I hope a lot of people reach out to you. Thank you for having me, Klaus. Take care. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.